who have built one of the most precise atomic clocks in the world, that it has a variation of less than one second in 15 billion years. Time, it affects us all, even the symbol of time behind us, as you can see. But it's a question most of us have never even asked ourselves. What is time? Philosophers have been trying to answer that for centuries. Dr. Yi, what is time? Oh, that's a, <laughs> that, that, that is a question I think it's very hard to answer. Time seems to be one directional. We are floating with the time towards the future. You can have a lot of philosophical thoughts about it. I'm a sort of more like engineer kind of a person, a physicist. So we think about time more sort of around, it's a mechanism, what does that actually mean? I try to tell the time at the best I can, and we continue to create new technologies. Making atomic clock is just one small portion of human endeavors try to understand this very complex concept of time. Dr. Jun Yi is based at the University of Boulder in Colorado and recently received the 2022 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics for his pioneering research on atomic clocks. Together with my students and postdocs in our lab, we have built one of the most precise atomic clocks in the world. So precise that it has a variation of less than one second in 15 billion years. That's the age of the universe. So we don't have enough time to understand the fundamental nature of time itself. But what about the way we measure it? What is a second? To answer that, we need a little bit of a history lesson. In 350 BCE, Greek philosopher Aristotle defined time as the calculable measure of motion with respect to before and afterness. In 1090, a Chinese civil servant named Su Shong built one of the first mechanical clocks powered by water. In the 1650s, astronomer Christian Huygens realized that a regulator was needed. He invented the first pendulum clock. This was improved in the 18th century by John Harrison, who realized that smaller, higher frequency oscillators made clocks more reliable. In 1927, Canadian-born Warren Marison pioneered use of a quartz crystal which vibrates when placed in an electric circuit. In the 1960s, scientists began to use atoms as oscillators, building atomic clocks based on the element cesium. We used to be taught that electrons orbit the nucleus of their atoms like planets orbit the sun. More probably, they occupy what are known as probability fields also called orbitals, which come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. For each atom, there are several of these orbitals occupied by electrons in higher or lower energy states. When an electron moves from one orbital to another, that's known as a quantum jump. If the electron moves from a high energy orbital to one of lower energy, it gives off energy in the form of a photon or a particle of light. All this light, is the way nature wants to communicate with us. Each atom, you can think of as nothing but a light beacon. Uh, they get excited and they emit light. So light, in some sense, is our way that for our human beings to communicate with these microscopic world of atoms. So is it correct to say that the pendulum of your clock is an electron's relationship with its atom? Yes, that's right. It's all about electrons motion around the nucleus inside an atom, in our case, a strontium atom. We needed very, very stable lasers to be able to communicate with the atom, to find out that this, this orbital oscillation of electron around the nucleus. And when we, when we build atomic clock, all we are doing is to making sure the laser frequency is matched with 
the electronic oscillations around the nucleus. So you not only had to find out that strontium was the correct atom, you also had to build incredibly precise lasers. That's exactly right. You know, that's what laser is. And you tuned it onto a particular transition of atom. It's like a particular station you just dialed in to communicate with the atom. You have to tune it such that you, you find their particular frequency of these atoms. Once they are in the excited state, you can say, well, how do I measure that atom? So you can use a different sets of lasers. You know, you have one laser to just tickling with the energy transitions of this particular clock. And then you can have other lasers to be helping you to find out whether the electrons are being now promoted to the excited state or still living in the ground state. So having them work in tandem allows you to figure out, well, where the electron is located uh, in terms of its orbital with respect to the nucleus. And in, if it's uh, located in the, in the ground state, how do I tune my clock laser frequency such that I can promote the electron to the excited state? And then you can see whether after a long period of time, whether the electron motion and the laser evolution is still in phase. If you if you they are, then you say, aha, my laser frequency is matched to the electron motion around the nucleus. Dr. Ye and his team have trapped hundreds of thousands of atoms in a vacuum chamber. By shining a finely tuned laser at these atoms, he's able to excite electrons to jump in a controlled way. Another laser measures the number of photons given off, and over all the hundreds of thousands of atoms, he is able to measure how many times electrons jump, on average, every second. Older atomic clocks use cesium atoms, which oscillate at just over 9 billion cycles per second. But Dr. Yi's team is now using the element strontium, which has 50,000 more transitions per second than cesium. So your clock's more accurate than cesium because the fundamental properties of strontium mean that excitation happens more often, which means you can subdivide the second into finer and finer intervals. You got it. I mean, what you just said in the last sentence is the essence of the modern atomic clock. Yes, exactly. In a certain period of time, say a second, we just got a more pendulum swings, if I may use the word pendulum, it's a quantum pendulum. We got more swings, and therefore we can subdivide the second more finely, more precisely, and therefore our measurement accuracy and precision improves. This improvement promises to have huge applications in the real world. Imagine the clock being so good that you can actually test those fundamental theories at a better, better precision because we are building a standard that's connected to nature. As we dig deeper and deeper, being able to measure things better and better or define the time with a more and more a better precision and accuracy, I will be able to measure how the glacier is melting, how the groundwater is moving around, the ocean level is changing, how the gravity is changing on Earth due to the environmental change. That should be connected to the time because time and space is in one if you could actually measure them very accurately. So you can see there's always two sides of the same coin, fundamental science and application that will benefit the society. As well as monitoring for weather changes, the atomic clock could also be applied to tracking systems such as GPS or self-driving cars. But that's not all. I'm not sure how far down this path you are, but you've postulated that if you can get a clock accurate enough, you might be able to detect particles of dark matter. It, it theoretically makes up most of the stuff in the universe, but so far has completely eluded our own uh, detection on Earth. We know that, for example, stars are moving way too fast at the edge of the galaxy, and by ordinary gravity, it should not have been. So how could that be? There must be something invisible that's holding the galaxy together. So one of the theories proposed the dark matter is ultra light, and it's just have lots, lots of massive uh, m numbers of particles around that. But you have so many of them, they can create the halo along your, around your uh, galaxy. Physicists have postulated that they were coupled to electromagnetic fields. 
This is where the expertise of Professor Yi's team comes in. Amazingly, they can actually measure the effect electromagnetic fields have on time. The dependence of how the electrons are moving around the nucleus could be influenced by the fact dark matter is changing some of the fundamental constants that we think governs the universe. And so if we can measure between different atomic clocks and suddenly you, we find, well, some of the atoms are telling you the time in a different rate. And if the, you, you rule out everything else and you find out, well, the rates of these two clocks are still different. Uh, and the, the difference can be attributed to something which is varying in time, like fundamental constants. Then you have a clue that maybe the dark matter is, uh, is modulating that our ordinary matter and the field through the signatures of the clocks. And so this is the one area that we think as we continue to improve the clock measurement sensitivity, maybe one day we will actually discover dark matter by just making a sensitivity better and better and better. Does that make sense? <laughs> it absolutely did make sense, which is really amazing me because when I started researching this and I looked at some of your talks, I was like, oh, I don't want to inter interview this man. I don't understand. But I feel like I do now. So that's a great accomplishment on your part. Thank you so much. Ah, <laughs> oh, it's finished. But don't worry, we've got a lot more Razor stories for you. All you need to do is like, comment and subscribe and hit the bell button below for notifications. We'll see you next time.